I want to begin by reading a couple of scriptures for you. Psalm 16, beginning with verse 5. And it, it, it goes this way. Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure, because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. You will make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Over to Luke's Gospel, chapter 18. This is a pretty familiar story, I think, and it's found in every one of the Gospels. Luke says this, A certain ruler asked Jesus, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother. And he replied, I have kept all of these since my youth. And when Jesus heard this, he said to him, there is still one thing lacking, sell all that you own and distribute the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. But when he heard this, he became sad, for he was very rich. And Jesus looked at him and said, How hard it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easy for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. And those who heard it said, Then who can be saved? And Jesus replied, what is impossible for mortals is possible for God. And then Peter said, look, we have left our homes and followed you. And Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God, who will not get back very much more in this age and in the age to come, eternal life. And finally, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1 again. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all of my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast or to be burned, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Let us pray. Open our hearts. God, we pray this morning that we may hear your voice and that as we leave here, we may be on your path the path of love. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Oh, so I told you last week was a sermon that I was preaching for credit, and, and it was a little different. And the style of the sermon was called a dialectical style. And you all know what that is, so I don't have to tell you. Now, it's really, it's, it's, a, it's a sermon style that's made up with a, by, by bringing up an antithesis, looking at the thesis, and then achieving a synthesis. Or, put another way, thanks Ken, it, it is a style of preaching that says, here's what's wrong. Here's what the Bible says you should do about it. And here's how you do it. And it is a style of preaching that has been very popular in the African American community since during the time of American slavery. You can imagine if you were an American 
slave in church as a preacher, you would begin your sermons with what's wrong in the world, right? I mean, you would have this kind of overwhelming negativity and you would go to the scripture to find out how to make it right. And so that form of dialectic preaching, Martin Luther King was really good at it. And it's basically saying, here's the problem, here's the solution, and here's how we synthesize them. And I'm not going to do that again this week, just, just to tell you. But, uh, but one of the comments from this group that met with me was, um, well, it kind of went like this, great sermon pastor, it was too negative. And when I regained my composure, I said, it's not my fault. The Apostle Paul was being negative, right? If I do this and I don't do that, and, 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 yeah, right? And so there's all these negative points. Well, this morning, we're just going to turn Paul up on his head and, and say what he said in a positive light. And when I have said something that is funny, I will point at you. <laughs> Because clearly the first service was not in the mood. And, and even John Sims, during the prayer request time, said something funny and nobody laughed. And so it wasn't just me. Um, but they're not, you know, they're, they're not the brightest bulbs, the first, first, uh, first group. <laughs> They're just, they're just not awake. Yeah, I know. I know. But that little bit of rain, there were about a hundred drops of rain that hit my car. And that, it messes with you. <laughs> it's almost like God is saying, remember you're supposed to be praying for rain. And, and uh, yeah. Listen, the sermon title this morning then is My Mouth, My Mind, My Money, and Myself. And Paul in 1 Corinthians 13 is doing this big exaggerated emphasis. Even if I understand all things, even if I give my body to be burned and have not love, I am nothing. I don't profit anything. And so we're just going to look at each one of those beginning with our mouths. And that takes us back to verse 1. If I speak with the tongues of men and angels. Our mouth is clearly made for more than just chewing and spitting, right? It is made to speak. But James, in his epistle, boy, James doesn't like our mouth or our tongues at all. Let me read what he wrote. He writes in chapter 3, The tongue is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body and sets the course of one's life on fire. And it is by itself on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds and reptiles and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. And this is the best line. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Now, the first service didn't cooperate with me, but I know you will. I'm asking you to, if we can test James's theory. Is the tongue evil and full of all kinds of deadly poison? So I'm just going to invite you to stick out your tongue at, at your neighbor. Go ahead. Yeah, wow. You, you all are in a mood. I can tell already. Now, what you just saw, if you had the privilege of looking at your neighbor's tongue, was possibly 700 different strains of bacteria. <laughs> Now, most of you only have 30 to 70 going on at any one time. But uh, it, truly, the tongue is full of yuck, right? It, we all know what James is saying, though, is that the words that come out of your mouth can come out for evil purposes. They can harm. Things can be said that scar us our whole life. On the flip side, though, our words can have impact on us for eternity in a good way. I bet you never considered that your mouth is part of the process of your salvation. Did you know that, Rod? I bet you did. The word Paul says in Romans 10 is near you, even in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith, Paul says, that we are preaching. And if you confess with your bacteria-laden tongue that Jesus is Lord, and if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, 
resulting in righteousness. And with the mouth, he confesses, listen, resulting in salvation. What comes out of our mouth, what we confess is really, really important. The prophet Ezekiel was told by the Spirit of God as he was looking over this valley of dead, dry bones. Speak to them and they will come back to life. There is power in our mouths. Power to speak good. Power to prophesy God's word. Power to create. Power to heal. The power to confess. In Genesis 1, we all have read, in the beginning, God created everything. And he did it with his word. He did it with his word. Our faith is a faith of words. We even understand Jesus himself. It, it gets mystical, but John says, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. What comes out of our mouths, our words, are so important. Paul says, though, whatever comes out of your mouth, if it doesn't have love, it's just noise. And I want to ask, can we turn Paul upside down and say that in a positive? And maybe this is one way to look at it. For my words to matter, I must love. Or if I love, my words can mean so much more. And, and you don't even have to speak well at all. And here's a sentence that I took a lot of time with. And I thought it was kind of funny, but the first service did not. And I blamed them. So here we go. Even if you speak with the elocution of an anthropomorphized banana slug. Uh, yeah, right, right? Even if you speak with the elocution of, a, of an anthropomorphized banana slug, if you speak with love, it will be beautiful. You can speak pig Latin with a mouthful of peanut butter and half a set of false teeth. <laughs> But if you speak with love, the sounds you make will be beautiful sounds. They can be powerful sounds, transformative sounds, God's sounds. I think Paul was trying to say that, you know, the banana slug thing. It just, he lacked the words. Give your words love, and you will give your words power. Next, my mind. I know what you're saying. He's lost his mind. But I think all of verse 2, prophecy, wisdom, knowledge, faith, Paul in some way is referencing what we think, our minds. And God has given us amazing minds and the ability to reason, the ability to build knowledge generation upon generation. And then God invites us to literally use our heads. Isaiah 18, come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be white as snow. In Romans 8, 6, Paul says, set your minds on the things of the Spirit and you will find life and peace. Paul tells us to think on some things in Philippians. Whatsoever things are true or noble or right or pure or lovely. Whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, Paul says, think about these things. Ours is not only a faith of words, it's a faith of the mind. We are created in God's image. We are created also to think, to think about wisdom, to consider knowledge, and to wonder about the mysteries of creation. And Paul says, even if we engage our minds in magnificent ways, if we don't engage them with love, it doesn't matter. How can we put that into the positive? If you give your mind to God, 
If you add love to your knowledge, if you add care for others to your thoughts, then you are not nothing. Isn't that a double negative of some sort? Yeah, yeah but you understood it, right? In first service, they're like, huh? <laughs> if you add love to your knowledge, you're quite spectacular. You may not be the smartest person on the earth, but if you love, you are so valuable to God. You may be as educated as a turnip and about as smart as a block of Hillmar cheddar. <laughs> but if you love, you and your thoughts are worthy in God's eyes. Add love to your mouth. Add love to your thoughts. And then add love to your money. And you people are already saying, Oh, I love my money. Thank you very much. That's not what I'm talking about. Paul says, If I give all of my possessions... If I give it all away to the poor, all of my stuff, everything I've owned or will ever own, if I give it all away, not just 10% or an occasional 50 bucks to a missionary, if I give everything and I don't give in love, I gain nothing. St. Francis was so moved to empty himself of every worldly thing, he stripped down to his birthday suit in the town center of Assisi. We won't be doing that this week. But he wanted to be free of everything. And he added love to his giving. If I give it all away and have no love, Paul says, it is of no benefit to me. It's amazing. We read about the rich young ruler just a little while ago. And as Christ challenged him to let go of his possessions, he turned away and left saddened. He gained nothing. I wanted to write a story about the rich young ruler. I would title it The Apostle That Never Was. He was so close to following Jesus. I asked my son Isaac, I said, Isaac, I need a name for someone, the rich young ruler, and Isaac didn't miss a beat. And he said, how about Kim Jong-un? He's a rich young ruler. Yeah, the first service didn't get that one either. Um, it'll come to you as you have dinner. A mouth with no love is just noise. A mind with no love is nothing. And giving away everything you have without love gains you nothing. You just leave sad and empty. There was another person in the Gospels. He's uh, known as the wee little man. Does anybody know his name? Zacchaeus, right? He was about yay tall. Um, we have no idea. But, you know, according to the song I learned in Sunday school, he, he wanted to see Jesus and he had to climb up in the sycamore tree to see over everybody's head. And he was a tax collector. Tax collectors were hated back then. Is that still true? And, 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 and so nobody liked him. And Jesus walked up to him and said, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house for lunch. Look at what happened when he did. Zacchaeus stood up, Luke's gospel uh, says, in chapter 19, Zacchaeus stood up and said, Lord, look, look, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. Today salvation has been gained. You can feel Christ's love in this passage. I think we can spin Paul's negative then into positive by saying that your love and not your possessions, your love and not your money have purchased power in God's kingdom. You don't need any money to gain. You just need to give your love. Love people. My mouth, my mind, my money, and finally, Paul says, myself. Or if I give my body to boast, or I give my body to be burned. 
Pick up a different translation of the, of the New Testament and you'll find both translations in there. Paul either says, though I give my body to boast or I give my body to be burned. And both are acceptable because we don't know which one he wanted. But they're both in there. The New Living Translation, however, captures it this way. That's a 78 Harley, uh, Harley Davidson. That's 79. Um, if I gave everything I have to the poor, probably was my brother interrupting it. Uh, if I gave everything I have to the poor, the New Living Translation says, and even sacrifice my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. And, and in Paul's analogy then, if you've given all you have, all you have left is yourself. And maybe this is just the end of his grand hyperbole, his big exaggeration. Maybe this is where it comes to a halt. When he says, at the end of the day, if all you have left is you, and you give that away, but you don't love, you don't get anything back. You don't win. You may have physical strength. You may be able to accomplish great things with your strength in your body. You may give it even as a martyr. But if you don't love, Paul says, there's nothing to gain. Now, after last week's sermon, I gathered with this group that, you know, talked to me about it. And one of the members of the group, who shall rename, uh, remain nameless, said, uh, Pastor, it was a good sermon, but all of your illustrations were out there. And then Margaret, oops, sorry. Um, <laughs> then Margaret said, why don't you use illustrations closer to home? And I thought, well, that works. And so I just want to close this sermon with a, a story from our own congregation. As I was preparing this sermon on Friday evening, uh, my phone rang and interrupted my sermon preparation. And the person on the other end of the phone began to tell me about something that they did. He said, let me tell you what we did yesterday. And I listened and he said, as I was heading to work, I passed the same AM, PM mini market that I do every day. And I saw the same homeless guy that I see every day. And this member of our church said, some days I pull in there to get gas and I'll get him something to eat or something to drink. And I've gotten to know his name. And we've had a little casual conversations. But this person said to me Thursday morning as I drove into town, he was not standing by the door of the gas station. He was sitting literally in the gutter. And this, this individual called his wife and he said, Honey, Danny, that's not his real name, Danny is sitting in the gutter. And he said, if, she was a, if he was a puppy or a kitten, I'd bring him home. And she said, Sounds good to me. And so he pulled in and he said to Danny, he said, if you're here when I get off work, I'm going to pick you up and take you home for a hot meal and a bath. And you can stay at our house tonight. And so on the way home, he swung back in, he picked up Danny, he drove him home and he said he obviously hadn't been in a vehicle for a while because he rolled down the window and let the wind just kind of push his arm around and enjoyed the ride when they got home, he said, we, you know, we shared a beer together in the shade. Got to know him a little bit. And I asked him, what's your favorite dinner? And he said, I love enchiladas with red sauce. And so this fellow called his wife and said, on the way home, get everything to make enchiladas with red sauce. And they had dinner. And he said, Danny only could take three bites. It became obvious that his stomach cannot handle a lot of food because he doesn't eat a lot of food. And after dinner, he went and he sat on the couch. And this person gave him the remote control and he didn't know what to do with it. And he said, wow, that's when I realized he never gets to watch TV either. Much less ever get to sit on furniture. He's got nowhere. 
As I watched TV, he said, my children treated him like a long lost uncle. They just were thrilled to have a guest in the home. And then he put him in the bathtub and said, soak. Soak for a good long time because it's been a good long time since he had a, had a bath. When he got out of the bath, our church member gave him some clothes, gave him a mattress, and gave him his dignity back for that day. In the morning, gave him a backpack with some medicine for his sores and some bottled water, a little bit of food, and drove him back to the AM PM and let him off and said, Danny, if you're here next Thursday at 5 p.m., we'll do it again. Every week, as long as you want to. And I was like, wow, there's my sermon right there. And I said, that's a marvelous thing that you've, you've done. And he said to me, i got to read this now because I've lost it. He said, you know, one of these days, Danny's going to die. And it might be soon. Someone will need to be able to speak about him. And I will be that person. And I thought, wow, that's exactly agape love. And you don't have to go out and bring a homeless person into your house for a day or a week. But you can if the Spirit moves you for sure. But you do. We all have to reach out to others somehow in love. That's the whole point. That is the way of Christ. You don't have to be eloquent to love. You don't have to have money to love. You don't have to have knowledge to love. You don't have to be a well-educated to tutor for our tutoring program. Did anybody see the paper? We got a great write-up in the, in the journal. You can find a way, you can find a place to reach out and love a little bit more this week than you did last week. If you do, if you reach out to other people with compassion, with understanding, with forgiveness, then your words will be beautiful words. Your life will have so much meaning and you will be blessed. Jesus said, in this life and in the life to come. And with that, I will say, Amen.